The House will come to order. Mr. Speaker, the Vice President and the United States Senate. The joint meeting will come to order. The chair appoints members of the committee on part of the House to escort His Excellency Narendra Modi into the chamber. The gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Scalise. The gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Emmer. The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Stefanik. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Hudson. 
The gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Waltz. The gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Barr. The gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Fitzpatrick. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Gallagher. The gentlewoman from California, Mrs. Kim. The gentleman from North Carolina, Mr. Rouser. The gentleman from South Dakota, Mr. Johnson. The gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Wilson. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Jeffries. The gentlewoman from Massachusetts, Ms. Clark. The gentleman from California, Mr. Aguilar. The gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Delbin. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Nagoose. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pallone. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Meeks. The gentleman from California, Mr. Barra. The gentlewoman from Washington, Ms. Jayapal. The gentleman from California, Mr. Khanna. The gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Kirshnamurti. The gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Tanador. The members of the escort. Oh, sorry. The President of the Senate, at the direction of that body, appoints the following senators as members of the committee on the part of the Senate to escort His Excellency Narendra Modi, Prime Minister of the Republic of India, into the House chamber. The Senator from New York, Mr. Schumer. The Senator from Illinois, Mr. Durbin. The Senator from Minnesota, Ms. Klobuchar. The Senator from Virginia, Mr. Warner. The Senator from New Jersey, Mr. Menendez. The Senator from Kentucky, Mr. McConnell. The Senator from West Virginia, Mrs. Capito. The Senator from Iowa, Ms. Ernst. The Senator from Montana, Mr. Daines. And the Senator from Idaho, Mr. Risch. That is. The members of the escort committee will exit the chamber through the lobby doors. Mr. Speaker, the Acting Dean of the Diplomatic Corps.
Mr. Speaker, the President's Cabinet.
Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister of the Republic of India. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you His Excellency Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of the Republic of India. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, distinguished members of the U.S. Congress, ladies and gentlemen, Namaskar. It is always a great honor to address the United States Congress. It is an exceptional privilege to do so twice. <laughs> For this honor, I extend my deepest gratitude on behalf of the 1.4 billion people of India. I see that nearly 
half of you were here in 2016. I feel your warm as old friends. I can also see the enthusiasm of a new friends in the other half. I remember Senator Harry Reid, Senator John McCain, Senator Orrin Hatch, Elijah Cummings, Elsie Hastings, and others who I met here in 2016. And who are sadly no longer with us. Mr. Speaker, standing here seven Junes ago, that is the June when Hamilton swept all the awards. <laughs> I said that the hesitations of history were behind us. Now, when our era, it is, a cross, uh, is at a crossroads, I'm here to speak about our calling for this century. Through the long and widening road that we have traveled, we have met the test of friendship. A lot has changed since I came here seven summers ago. But a lot has remained the same, like our commitment to deepen the friendship between India and the United States. In the past few years, there have been many advances in AI, artificial intelligence. At the same time, there have been even more momentous development in another AI, America and India. Mr. Speaker and distinguished members, the beauty of democracy is the constant connect with the people to listen to them and feel their pulse. And I know this takes a lot of time, energy, effort, and travel. It is a Thursday, Thursday afternoon, a fly-out day for some of you. <laughs> so I'm grateful for your time. I also know how busy you have been this last month. Being a citizen of a vibrant democracy, Myself, I can admit one thing, Mr. Speaker, you have a tough job. <laughs> I can relate to the battles of patience, persuasion, 
and policy. I can understand the debate of ideas and ideology. But I am delighted to see you come together today to celebrate the bond between world's two great democracies, India and the United States. Thank you. I'm happy to help out. I'm happy to help out. Whenever you need a strong bipartisan consensus, <laughs> there will be and there must be a contest of ideas at home, but we must also come together as one when we speak for our nation. <laughs> and you have shown that you can do it. Congratulations. Mr. Speaker, the foundation of America was inspired by the vision of a nation of equal people. Throughout your history, you embrace people from around the world, and you have made them equal partners in the American dream. There are millions here who have roots in India. Some of them sit proudly in this chamber. And there is one behind me yeah. who <laughs> who had made history. I'm told that the Samosa Caucus. is now the flavor of the house. <laughs> I hope it grows and brings the full diversity of Indian cuisine here. <laughs> Over two centuries, we have inspired each other through the lives of great Americans and Indians. We pay tribute to Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King, Jr. We also remember many others who work for liberty, equality, and justice. Today, I also wish to pay heartfelt tribute to one of them, Congressman John Lewis.
Mr. Speaker, democracy is one of our sacred and shared values. It has evolved over a long time and taken various forms of systems. Throughout history, however, one thing has been clear. Democracy is the spirit that supports equality and dignity. <laughs> Democracy is the idea that welcomes debate and discourse. Democracy is the culture that gives wings to thought and expression. India is blessed to have such values from times immemorial. In the evolution of the democratic spirit, India is the mother of democracy. <laughs> Millennia ago, our oldest scripture said, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahudha Vadanti. It means that truth is one, but the wise express it in a different ways. Now, the U.S. is the oldest and India the largest democracy. Our partnership augurs well for the future of democracy. Together, we shall give a better future to the world and a better world to the future. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, last year, India celebrated 75 years of its independence. Every milestone is important, but this one was a special. We celebrated a remarkable journey of over 75 years of freedom after a thousand years of foreign rule in one form or another. This was not just a celebration of democracy, but also of diversity not just of constitution, but also of its spirit of our social empowerment, not just of our competitiveness and cooperative federalism, but also of our essential unity and integrity. <laughs> we have over 2,500 political parties Yes, you heard that right, 2,500. <laughs> About 20 different parties govern various states of India. We have 22 official languages and thousands of dialects and yet we speak in one voice. <laughs> Every hundred miles our cuisine changes. 
from dosa to alu paratha and from sikhan to sandesh we enjoy all of this we are home to all faiths in the world and we celebrate all of them in india diversity is a natural way of life today the world wants to know more and more about india i see that curiosity in this house too we were honored to receive over 100 members of the us congress in india over the last decade <laughs> everyone wants to understand india's development democracy and diversity everyone wants to know what india is doing right and how among close friends i am happy to share the same mr speaker when i first visited the us as a prime minister india was the 10th largest economy in the world 10th today india is the fifth largest economy and and <laughs> india will be the third largest economy soon <laughs> we are not only growing bigger but we are also growing faster when india grows the whole world grows after all we are one sixth of the world's population in the last century when india won its freedom it inspired many other countries to free themselves from colonial rule in this century when india sets benchmark in growth it will inspire many other countries to do the same our vision is sabka saath sabka vikas sabka vishwas sabka prayas it means together for everyone's growth with everyone's trust and everyone's efforts let me share with you how this vision is translating into action with speed and scale we are focusing on infrastructure development we have given nearly 40 million homes to provide shelter to over 150 million people that is nearly six times the population of australia <laughs> the 
we run a national health insurance program that ensures free medical treatment for about 500 million people. Five hundred million people, that is greater than the population of South America. We took banking to the unbank with the world's largest financial inclusion drive. Nearly five hundred million people benefited. This is close to the population of North America. We have worked on building digital India. Today, there are more than 850 million smartphones and internet users in the country. <laughs> this is more than the population of Europe. We protected our people with 2.2 billion doses of made in India COVID vaccines. And that too free cost. I may be running out of continent soon. So I will stop here. <laughs> Distinguished members, the Vedas are one of the world's oldest scriptures. They are a great treasure of humanity composed thousands of years ago. Back then, women sages compose many verses in these Vedas. And today, in modern India, women are leading us to a better future. <laughs> India's vision is not just of development which benefits women. It is of women-led development, where women lead the journey of progress. A woman has risen from a humble tribal background to be our head of states. Nearly 1.5 million, 1.5 million elected women lead us at various levels. And that is of local governments. Today, women serve our country in the Army, Navy, and Air Force. India also had the highest, highest percentage of women airline pilots in the world. And they have also put us on Mars by leading our Mars mission. I believe that Investigating in a girl child lifts up the entire family. Empowering women transform the nation. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, India is an ancient nation with a youthful population. India is known for its traditions, 
but the younger generation is also making a hub of technology, be it creative reels on Insta or real-time payments. Coding or quantum computing, machine learning or mobile apps, fintech or data science, the youth of India are a great example of how a society can embrace the latest technology. In India, technology is not about innovation, but also about inclusion. Today, digital performance are empowering the rights and dignity of people while protecting, protecting privacy. In the last nine years, over a billion people got a unique digital biometric identity connected with their bank accounts and mobile phones. This digital public infrastructure helps us reach citizens within seconds with financial assistance. 850 million people receive direct benefit financial transfers into their accounts. Three times a year, over 100 million farmers receive assistance in their bank accounts at the click of a button. The value of such transfer has crossed $320 billion. And we have saved over $25 billion in the process. If you visit India, you will see everyone is using phones for payments, including street vendors. Last year, out of every 100 real-time digital payments in the world, 46 happened in India. <laughs> Nearly 400,000 miles of political fiber, uh, optical fiber, optical fiber cables, and cheap data have ushered in a revolution of opportunities. Farmers check weather updates. The elderly get social security payments. Students access scholarships. Doctors deliver telemedicine. Fishermen check fishing grounds and small businesses get loans with just a tap on their phones. Mr. Speaker, a spirit of democracy, inclusion, and sustainability defines us. It also shapes our outlook to the world. India grows while being responsible about our planet. We believe Mata Bhumihi Putro Aham Prutviya. This means the earth is our mother and we are her children. Indian culture deeply respects the environment and our planet. Thank you. While becoming the fastest growing economy, we grew our solar capacity by 2,300%. Yes, you have heard right. 2,300%. We became the only 
only G20 country to meet its Paris commitment. <laughs> we made renewables account for over 40 percent of our energy sources nine years ahead of the target of 2030. But we did not stop there. At the Glasgow summit, I propose mission life, lifestyle for environment. This is a way to make sustainable sustainability a true people's movement to live it to be the job of governments alone by being mindful in making choices every individual can make a positive impact making sustainability a mass movement we help the world reach the net zero target faster. Our vision is pro-planet progress. Our vision is pro-planet prosperity. Our vision is pro-planet people. Mr. Speaker, we live by the motto of Vasudhaya Kutumkam or the world is one family. <laughs> Our engagement with the world is for everyone's benefit. The one son one world, one grid, seek to join us. All is connecting the world with clean energy. <laughs> one Earth, One Health is a vision for global action to bring quality health care to everyone, including animals and plants. The same spirit is also seen in the theme when we chair the G20. One Earth, one family, one future. We advance the spirit of unity through yoga as well. Just yesterday, the whole world came together to celebrate the International Day of Yoga. <laughs> Just last week, all nations joined our proposal at the UN to build a memorial wall to honor the peacekeepers. And this year, the whole world is celebrating the International Year of Millets to promote sustainable agriculture and nutrition alike. During COVID, we delivered vaccines and medicines to over 150 countries. We reach out to others. Doing disasters at first respondents, as we do for our own. We share our modest resources with those who need them the most. We build capabilities, not dependencies. Mr. Speaker, when I speak about India's approach to the world, 
the United States occupy a special place. I know. Our, our relations are of great importance to all of you. Every member of this Congress has a deep interest in it. When defense and aerospace in India grow, industries in the state of Washington, Arizona, Georgia, Alabama, South Carolina, and Pennsylvania thrive. When American companies grow their, their research and development centers in India thrive, when Indians fly more, a single order of air, for aircrafts creates more than a million jobs in 44 states in America. <laughs> when an American phone makers invest in India, it creates an entire ecosystem of jobs and opportunities in both countries. When India and U.S work together on semiconductors and critical minerals. It helps the world in making supply chains more diverse, resilient, and reliable. Indeed, Mr. Speaker, we were strangers in defense cooperation at the turn of century. Now, the United States has become one of our most important defense partners. Today, India and the U.S. are working together in space and in the seas, in science and in semiconductors, in startups and sustainability, in tech and in trade, in farming and in finance in art and artificial intelligence, in energy and education, in healthcare and humanitarian efforts. I can go on and go on, but to sum up it by, I would say, the scope of our cooperation is endless. The potential of our synergies is limitless. And the chemistry in our relations is effortless. In all this, Indian Americans have played a big role. They are brilliant in every field not just in spelling B. <laughs> With their hearts and minds, talent and skills, and a love for America and India, they have connected us. They have unlocked doors. They have shown the potential of our partnership. Mr. Speaker, distinguished members, every Indian Prime Minister and American President of the past has taken our relationship further. But our generation has to honor of taking it a greater heights. I agree with President Biden. 
that this is a defining partnership of this country. Because it serves a larger purpose, democracy, demography, and destiny give us the purpose. One consequence of globalization has been to cover over concentration of supply chains. We will work together to diversify decentralized and democratized supply chains. <laughs> Technology will determine the security, prosperity, and leadership in the 21st century. That is why our two countries established a new initiative for critical and emerging technologies. Our knowledge partnership will serve humanity and seek solution to the global challenges of climate change, hunger, and health. Mr. Speaker and distinguished members, the last few years have seen deeply disruptive developments. With the Ukraine conflict, war has returned to Europe. It is causing great pain in the region. Since it involves major powers, the outcomes are severe. Countries of the global south have been particularly affected. The global order, order is based on the respect for the principle of the UN Charter. Peaceful resolution of disputes and respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity. As I have said directly and publicly, this is not an era of war. But it is one of dialogue and diplomacy. And we all must do what we can to stop the bloodshed and human suffering. Mr. Speaker, the dark clouds of coercion and confrontation are casting their shadow in the Indo-Pacific. The stability of the region has become one of the central concerns of our partnership. We share a vision of a free, open, and inclusive Indo-Pacific. Connected by secure seas, defined by international law, free from domination and anchored in Asian centrality. A region where all nations, small and large, 
are free and fearless in their choices, where progress is not suffo suffocated by an impossible burdens of debt. <laughs> where connectivity is not leveraged for strategic purposes, where all nations are lifted by the high tide of shared prosperity. Our vision does not seek to contain or exclude, but to build a cooperative region of peace and prosperity. We work through regional institutions and with our partners from within the region and beyond. Of this, Paul has emerged as a major force of good for the region. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, more than two decades after 9-11, and more than a decade after 26-11 in Mumbai, Radicalism and terrorism still remain a pressing danger for the whole world. <laughs> These ideologies keep taking new identity and forms, but their intentions are the same. Terrorism is an enemy of humanity, and there can be no ifs and buts in dealing with it. <laughs> we must overcome all such forces sponsoring and exporting terror. Mr. Speaker, COVID-19's biggest impact was the human loss and suffering it caused. I wish to remember Congressman Ron Wright and the staff members who lost their lives to COVID. As we emerge out of the pandemic, we must give shape to a new world order. Consideration, care, and concern are the need of the hour. Giving a voice to the global south is the way forward. That is why I firmly believe that the African Union be given full membership of G20. Okay. Okay. We must revive multilateralism and reform multilateral institutions with better resources, and representation that applies to all our global institutions of governance, especially the United Nations. When the world has changed, our institutions too must change. Or risk getting replaced by a world of rivalries without rules in working for a world, new world order based on international law. Our two countries will be at the forefront as partners. <laughs> Mr. Speaker and distinguished members, Today, 
we stand at the new dawn in our relationship that will not only shape the destiny of our two nations, but also that of the world. As the young American poet, Amanda Gorman has expressed, when day comes, we step out of the shade. Aflame and unafraid, the new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light if only we are brave enough to see it. Our trusted partnership, our trusted partnership is like the sun in this new dawn that we spread light all around. I am reminded of a poem that I once wrote. Asman me sir uthakar. Asman me sir uthakar. Ghane badalo ko cheer kar. Roshni ka sankalp le. Abhi to suraj uga hai. Abhi to suraj uga hai. Dran nishay ke saath chal kar. दृढ़ निश्चय के साथ चलकर हर मुश्किल को पार कर घोर अंधेरे को मिटाते घोर अंधेरे को मिटाने अभी तो सूरज उगा है इफ आई वाय टू से इट इन इंग्लिश इट वुड बी Rising its head in the skies, piercing through the dense clouds with the promise of light. The sun has just risen, armed with a deep resolve, overcoming all the odds to dispel the forces of darkness. The sun has just risen. Mr. Speaker and distinguished members, we come from different circumstances and history, but we are united by a common vision and by a common destiny. When our partnership progresses, economic resilience increases, innovation grows, Science flourishes, knowledge advances, humanity benefits, our seas and skies are safer, democracy will shine brighter, and the world will be better place. That is the mission of our partnership. That is our calling for this century. Mr. Speaker and distinguished members, even by the high standards of our partnership, this visit is one of the great positive transformation. Together, we shall demonstrate that democracy is better and democracy is deliver. count on your continued support to the India-U.S. partnership. When I was here in 2016, 
I said that our relationship is prime for a momentous future. That future is today. Thank you once again, Mr. Speaker, Madam Vice President, and the distinguished members of this honor. God bless America. Jai Hind. Long live India-US friendship. Thank you.